Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as any other information about all the Historical Society's programs and services can be found on our website, nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. I also want to mention we are starting to uh, take these programs and they are appearing on YouTube. So this is another possibility for you to um, take a look at these great programs that we have. Our speaker today is uh, a young lady by the name of Megan Griffiths, who is a conservation technician from the Nebraska State Historical Society's Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center in Omaha. The title of her topic today is Sunken Treasure, Conserving the Metal from the Steamboat Bertrand. Please welcome Megan Griffiths. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, I'd like to thank the Ford Center staff for being here, and um, especially like to thank Dean Knudsen, the curator of the Bertrand Collection at DeSoto, and the other DeSoto staff um, that are here today. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to start out my talk giving a brief history of the discovery and excavation of the Bertrand, as well as a description of the history and conservation of the artifacts found on board. I'll touch briefly on, the cons on conservation as a profession, and will end my talk with the development of the current metals conservation project and the treatments that are currently being done at the Ford Center in Omaha. And I'll be happy to take any questions at the end of the talk. So, the Steamboat Bertrand. The Steamboat Bertrand was built, built in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1864. She was a typical Ohio River sternwheeler and did service on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers from 1865 1864 to 1865. She was described in a newspaper of the time as a nice, trim little steamer, neat but not gaudy, and sits upon the water like a duck. She was purchased by the Montana and Idaho Transportation Line, headquartered in St. Louis. Leaving two days late, she departed St. Louis on March 18, 1865, loaded with groceries and goods for stops along the Missouri River and the mining towns of western Montana Territory. She was a veritable Walmart on the water, and she was packed light with an estimated cargo of 250 to 300 tons of canned foods, tools, dry goods, medicinal bitters, munitions, and box after box of matches. Her crew and passengers numbered at least 120 people, but there were probably more on board. At 3 p.m. on April 1st, 1865, only eight days before Lee's surrender at Appomattox, the Bertrand hit a submerged log in the DeSoto Bend of the Missouri River which is located about 50 miles by water and 20 by land north of Omaha. Although the boat sank in as little as 10 minutes, no lives were lost. The Bertrand met an all too common end for steamships on the Missouri River. In fact, the Bertrand herself was built from the machinery salvaged from the wreck of the A.J. Sweeney, which had hit a bridge pier on the Cumberland River in Tennessee and had caught fire. So you would think maybe they would take some hits. Um, the Bertrand and her cargo were insured, and the insurance company was quick to send out salvage divers to retrieve the valuable parts of the boat, her boilers and her paddle wheel. According to the historical account, the divers began to remove the valuable parts of her cargo, the carboys of mercury, but were called off the wreck of the Bertrand a month later to work another nearby wreck, the Cora II. By the time the Cora was salvaged and the divers returned to the Bertrand, her holt had silted in and no further work was possible. The Encyclopedia of Civil War Shipwrecks, which tells you that there were quite a few of them, lists the cargo as having 5,000 barrels of whiskey and 100 carboys of mercury. Legend built up around the Bertrand as a lost treasure ship with a fortune in gold, whiskey, and mercury on board. However, the 1865 divers did, in fact, remove most of the mercury and whiskey. When the excavation was complete, only nine carboys of mercury and 56 bottles of whiskey were recovered. The sunken treasure, and in the traditional sense, was nowhere to be found. In 1967, two Omaha men, Sam Corbino and Jesse Purcell, who were both pi private pilots, had met at Epley Airfield and formed a partnership to find the lost treasure ship. 
Studying maps and historical accounts, they located their search to DeSoto Wildlife Refuge and noticed a depression while flying over the refuge, which is marked by the red circle. They approached the refuge manager at the time for permission to perform a ground search. In an oral history interview, the manager at the time, Kermit Dibesetter, explained that he had approved the search, expecting them not to find anything, so that he could then in good conscience deny all future bird trans search requests, saying it had already been done and the boat was nowhere on the refuge. However, the salvers were able to detect a high metal reading in the proposed wreckage site using what amounts to a large metal detector. Test drills by Augur were done in February of 1968 and brought up samples that indicated the presence of 19th century materials 30 feet below the surface. The Bertrand had been found. So you can see here, um, they found lead balls, glass, mortar. So these were clearly man-made objects. They also found wood, and it was worked wood, so it wasn't just a log buried in the ground. So they knew it was um, obviously man-made objects, and it was also um, appropriate time-wise for being the Bertrand. Sam and Jesse went on to sign a U.S. General Services Administration contract to excavate the suspected site of the Bertrand. Under the terms of the contract, the salvers would receive 60% of the value of whiskey and the minerals. Because the site was on federal land, any objects found would become the property of the federal government. Digging began at the site in March 1968. The deck was reached in November of 1968, but excavation was halted during the winter to be resumed the following summer. Between late June and early September of 1965, they had reached the ship and were able to remove the cargo from the Bertrand's deck and hold. Missouri River mud proved to be a good preservative. The storage conditions in the ground in the 100 years or so after the sinking were nearly ideal. They were anaerobic, which means they were without oxygen. There was no light, and there were constant cool temperatures. These are the storage conditions any museum would want for their collection, cold, dark, and airless. But of course, that does not bode well for visitors who want to see the collection. The slightly acidic mud was beneficial to the protonaceous materials, such as the leather, the silk, and the wool that were found on board. The cellulosic materials, like cotton, paper, and hemp, did not fare so well. But once exposed to the air, all of the materials began to decay rapidly. A lot of the deterioration you see in the collection today occurred post-excavation. Initial treatment was limited to basic stabilization by keeping the cargo somewhat wet until further treatment could take place. A holding tank such as this was more the result of time, timing, and funding. Although it didn't provide the best conditions in which to store the objects, it helped protect them from the shock of being directly exposed to the air after so many years underground until the conservation staff could begin their work. Conservation activities began in 1969 in the eight-stall garage built at the refuge headquarters. The rows of refrigerators, as you can see here, um, were provided cold storage and air conditioners were placed in the garage doors of the bays where the cargo was being piled up to help control the temperature and relative humidity. By 1970, the Bertrand Conservation Laboratory was built and processing and treatment began in earnest. Conservation staff rapidly established protocols and priorities for treatment. For many artifacts, accepted treatments did not exist and the Bertrand staff pushed the horizons of conservation science. In the 1960s and early 70s, conservation was still a relatively young profession and the standards for treatment were still being established. Most of the initial conservation work done was simply to clean the objects, removing 100 years of river mud and sand. Also, <coughs> excuse me, many of the items were packed for shipping and had packing materials like straw or burlap bags around them that needed to be removed. Mold from keeping the objects wet was also a problem. For many of the organic materials, the drying process itself was a delicate operation involving the replacement of water with other chemicals designed to support the fragile cell walls. But much of the work done, particularly for the metal objects, is similar, what I do to, to, similar to what I do today. That is, removing the corrosion and applying protective coatings. And just a little bit of trivia, um, DeSoto at the time was the only wildlife refuge to have its own liquor license just because of the amount of alcohol that they had to use in treating the collection. So just a little interesting tidbit. Um, conservation practices can and do change. They have certainly changed since the Bertrand objects were originally treated. For instance, much of the cast iron recovered from the site was originally painted a variety of colors, including gold, copper, and brown. At the time of excavation and treatment, there was a notion that cast iron is supposed to be black. 
So most of the paint was either removed or coated with black lacquer. Thankfully, that black lacquer is relatively simple to remove. It can re be replaced with the clear lacquer, and I'll go into that a bit more later. The enthusiasm surrounding the discovery and excavation of the Bertrand is also apparent in the handling of the objects by staff and volunteers. In oral history interviews conducted by DeSoto staff, many of the workers often recalled that it was like Christmas every day. <laughs> Nonetheless, their use of artifacts would not be acceptable by today's standards. However, we can use their often humorous photographic evidence as good examples of what not to do. Today, we would not encourage the ringing of archaeological bells. That's not very safe for the objects. Um, the lighting of candles is essentially the destruction of cultural property. That would be proud upon. Um, handling of live munitions, also not good. This is a visiting congressman um, from Iowa, William Sherrill, I believe is how you say his name. Um, but they didn't know at the time that they were live, so we'll give them credit for that. Some more pictures here. Um, archaeological hats, we wouldn't recommend them, at least not until they're clean. Um, rare 19th century rubber slickers, we wouldn't recommend wearing them. Don't care how good your uh, Grant Wood American Gothic pose might be. <laughs> Smoking, like this gentleman is doing here, while working with objects and near flammable solvents. Really bad idea. <laughs> food. Not, not only could the food contaminate the object, but the object could contaminate your food or solvents in your food. Also a very bad idea. And this gentleman here is um, handling metal objects with, your, with his bare hands, which is not um, a good practice because the oils in your hands can etch into the, the metal, leaving your fingerprints and a permanent record that you handled it. Um, while we look back now with a shake of the head at some of the treatments done at the time, the successful treatment of such a large quantity of objects is a testament to the lab staff's professionalism and dedication. The collection survives today because of the work that they did. So we laugh, but they really did a good job. No one expected or was prepared for the volume of cargo which was recovered from the Bertrand, as you can see here. Item level inventory work is still going on, and the current count for the collection is around 680,000 objects. The numbers will continue to increase as item level inventory and cataloging progresses in the years ahead, and things like individual fish bones, wire, and buttons, um, if those are all individually numbered, that will increase the collection. Um, the following photos uh, show some of the examples of a variety of objects recovered, as well as the vast number of items. So we have um, textiles, toys, I said the rubber slickers, um, we even have hats that still had the feathers intact. Um, there was a great deal of archaeological food recovered, and uh, this refuge has been working with Dr. Larry Stone, who is a biologist at Dana College, and he's treated some of the foodstuffs. He'll check the wax seals, check for mold, and he changes out some of the liquids. But the FDA did do a test, I believe in the 70s, uh, to test some of the food, and it was still preserved. Um, they said it probably had lost some of its nutritional value, but and they wouldn't recommend eating it, but it was still safe. Um, and then here are some other you know, the boots and tools that were recovered. Uh, this photo shows how the objects are displayed at the visitor center. They are displayed in what is called open storage. So basically they are kept on shelves which can be seen behind glass. This is a great way to show this collection as it allows the visitors to see the vast scale of the recovered items as well as keep all the objects under careful storage conditions. By 1979, the bulk of the hands-on interventive conservation work was completed and the original lab was closed. However, preventive conservation continues to the present day. Preventive conservation is the practice of managing the risks posed to artifacts by display, movement, storage, and environmental conditions. Creating and maintaining a suitable environment is the most effective form of mass treatment because it benefits all of the objects in the collection at the same time. The refuge keeps careful environmental controls and the objects are stored in proper housings. This preventive conservation has and will continue to ensure the survival of the collection over the long term. By the late 1990s, the time had come to look at the collection again in terms of intervention. In the almost 20 years that had elapsed since the Bertrand Conservation Lab closed, the profession of conservation had come into its own. Practices have evolved and changed. Looking at these photos, um, the one on the left is the Bertrand conservation lab in the 1970s. It was a converted space and they had to work in the space that they had available, whereas the Ford Center on the right is, was a specifically built conservation lab. 
Um, so before I go into what we do at the, con at the Ford Center, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about conservation today and how that affects the treatments that we do. Conservation and restoration are two terms that are closely related but often confused. The aim of restoration is to make an object look and work like it did when it was new. This may involve reconstructing elements or adding and disguising new ones. Sometimes parts of the original, be parts of the original will be removed. Conservation, on the other hand, aims to stabilize and preserve all aspects of original materials and appearance of the object. Only after all the original materials are stabilized will a conservator consider the cosmetic or restoration aspects of an object. For example, the work on the Bertrand objects is meant to stabilize them for future use in research, not to look like new. The American Institute of Conservation for American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, better known as AIC, defines a conservator as a professional whose primary occupation is the practice of conservation and who, through specialized education, knowledge, training, ex and experience, formulates and implements all the activities of conservation in accordance with the ethical code, such as the AIC Code of Ethics and Guidelines for Practice. As the definition states, a conservator must adhere to a professional code of ethics and part of that code states that an extensive amount of training is required to become a conservator. There are only three schools in the U.S. that offer comprehensive conservation training. The University of Delaware in conjunction with the Winterton Museum, Buffalo State College, and New York University. Each master's program is three years and requires a background in studio arts, art history, cultural history, and chemistry, as well as 400 or more hours of hands-on conservation experience before a prospective student can even apply. I'm fortunate enough to have a paid position that allows me to get the hands-on lab experience I'll need, and I'm currently working on getting the chemistry credits that I need so that I can go back to school. So I have to go to school in order to go back to school. It's a very long process. There I am in the lab. Um, I'm not yet a trained conservator. As a conservation technician, I'm able to perform specific conservation treatment activities under the supervision of a conservator, in our, my case, Deb Verlong, who is our um, head objects conservator. I have a bachelor's degree in art history and a master in museum and gallery studies, so I do have the, some historical uh, background, and I also have some experience in interpretation and handling of objects. Um, a good simile I like to use is that a conservator is like a doctor for objects, and I am more like a nurse. I can give stitches and put on band-aids, but I can't perform major surgery. And on a side note, I would like to clarify that conservators work in laboratories or studios, not in conservatories. Those are usually for musicians. <laughs> so I get that a lot. Um, in addition to extensive training, it is imperative that conservators follow the AIC Code of Ethics and Guidelines for Practice. This ensures that the best practices for treatment and care are followed. For instance, conservation treatment must be documented. This is done visually through photography, before, during, and after treatment. Written documentation includes physical details about the artifacts, like dimensions, construction methods, structural and surface materials, and physical condition. Prior to carrying out any work on artifacts, conservators must thoroughly examine them and develop a written plan for treatment, explaining the current condition and the circumstances that warrant intervention. These written treatment proposals are discussed with and approved by the owner before conservation work proceeds. Once the work is completed, the cons conservator writes another report detailing materials and methods used to stabilize the object, along with long-term care instructions to help the owner protect the artifact over time. Another important aspect of conservation is the principle of reversibility. A conservator, if a conservator must compensate for loss, the treatment must be carried out in such a way that the repair can be removed without harm to the original materials. Excuse me, essentially, any treatment should be completed in such a way that another conservator could easily reverse the treatment if it would help in the preservation of the object or if, a current, or if current conservation practices ne necessitate the retreatment of an object. For instance, during the pilot project of this uh, metals project, the conservator at the time came across a lamp that had a particularly persistent coating. According to the original treatment report from the 70s, the lamp had been sprayed with a fixative five coats lightly. This mysterious fixative proved to be very difficult to remove. And in trying to remove it, the brown areas that you see on uh, the photograph on the right, on the left, sorry, <laughs> um, 
were probably original to the object and were in danger of being removed, so the fixative had to stay. And in the work that I'm doing, I've come across this, I don't know if it's the same fixative, but it's a similar coating that we don't know what, exactly what it is. And so I have to use a different solvent to remove it. And if I don't scrub at it and get it off, um, if I try and put a new coating on, that coating won't dry. And that's really bad for the object. The overarching concept for all ethical guidelines in conservation is the idea of stewardship. Conservators respect others' rights to cultural property, especially generations to come. The primary goal of conservators is the preservation of cultural material with the responsibility not only to the heritage itself, but also to the owner, the creator of the artifact, society as a whole, as well as to posterity. The present actions of the conservator will affect how the object is perceived for years to come, and it is therefore important that all sides be considered, not just those of the conservator or the present owner. By following the code of ethics, the conservator can ensure that intervention, or lack thereof, is in the best interest of the object. Part of the stewardship is helping museums and collectors determine the priority for treating their collections. A number of their items may be in need of conservation treatment, but some are in more dire need than others. For example, a curator may have a print with a tear and a copper pot that is corroding. The tear in the print would be exacerbated by handling, but it could be kept safe in proper storage. The corrosion of the pot, however, is degrading the object itself and threatening its survival as an example of cultural heritage. Therefore, a conservator would likely suggest that the corroding pot be treated first, while the print could be stored in a protective folder for treatment at a later date. So we're going to bring this all together. In order to determine these sorts of treatment priorities, a conservator is asked to conduct a conservation survey. This may consist of looking through an entire collection or a representative selection to see the general state of the collection and what sort of damage or deterioration might be present. The conservator also makes note makes note of what the storage or display conditions are for the objects and will recommend changes to current practices if needed. After gathering this information, the conservator can create a plan for treatment of the collection. And this is just what the staff of the DeSoto Refuge asked the Ford Center to do. So why did they approach the Ford Center? Although the Ford Center is part of the Nebraska State Historical Society, it is a regional conservation center. We provide conservation services for historical, cultural, educational, private, and corporate clients in the Midwest. The center has the resources for examination, evaluation, and conservation, specialized conservation treatment. The types of objects we treat can range from ceramics to glass, metals, ethnographic materials, archaeological materials, wooden artifacts, work of art on paper, photographs, documents, archival materials, books, and paintings. The Ford Center is a fully functioning objects lab which treats anything that is not, does not fall under the category of paper, painting, or textile. The objects lab is run by Deborah Long, seen here, our head objects conservator. Objects conservators are the generalists of conservation. They have to know a little bit about everything, including the other conservation disciplines, as an object can be made of many materials at once, in which might include paper, paint, or fabric. In October of 2008, the painting lab opened with Kenneth Bay as our head paintings conservator, and he can treat paintings on canvas or on wood panel or even wall murals. The center is also equipped with a paper lab, but we are currently between paper conservators. But if we had a conservator presently, we, they would be able to treat works of art on paper, such as watercolors, prints and drawings, as well as documents, books, and photographs. So knowing that they had this great resource just down the road, and knowing it was time to reassess the condition of the Bertrand collection, the DeSoto staff contacted the Ford Conservation Center to help determine their conservation needs. Between 2000 and 2003, a series of conservation surveys were conducted by the staff of the Ford Center with the help of the DeSoto Refuge staff in order to help in the development of long-term preservation plans for the Bertrand collections. Included in this survey were approximately approximately 10,000 metal objects ranging from tools and buttons to canned goods and silverware. The information regarding condition and housing was gathered and the data was evaluated. It was determined that the metal and rubber collections were in the greatest need of treatment. The survey results indicated that approximately 80% of the metals, metals collection was in fair to good condition, requiring no immediate emergency treatment. The remaining 20%, however, showed moderately active corrosion and was a need in conservation intervention. 
The metals project was divided into five phases. Phase one was the survey itself. Phase two consisted of a pilot project, which was conducted to determine the types of treatments that would be needed and the amount of time required to complete the project. It was determined that on average, each object, each object would require one to two hours of treatment. Phase three was one full year of treatment by a technician and about 875 objects were treated during that time. Phase four is the current phase, um, and it's when the bulk of the work is being done over three years. And phase five will consist of any remaining objects that require treatment by a trained conservator. We are currently in the second year of phase four, and I was hired to carry out the treatments for a large number of objects. The majority of the objects that come to us have been coated with a cellulose nitrate lacquer after their initial treatment in the 1970s. This coating creates a barrier from the elements, such as relative humidity, and rust, like you see on these doorknobs, um, begins to form in as little as 1% relative humidity. These coatings generally have a functional lifespan of approximately 20 years, at which point they begin to degrade and fail. As it ages, the coating will shrink and crack. Pinholes can form in the surface, and as corrosion products form, it expands, causing greater failure. It has now been over 30 years, so it's time to remove that coating remove the corrosion products that have formed, and put on a new coating, which is just what we do. Um, this is a joint project with DeSoto. So the refuge staff does their part by creating condition reports and photo photographing the objects before coming for treatment. This is done to maximize efficiency and minimize cost. While working with individual objects, the Ford Center will take the before and after photos. But with a project this large, it is mutually beneficial for DeSoto staff members to take care of that step in the process. After being photographed, the objects are then carefully boxed up and brought to the Ford Center by DeSoto staff in groups of about 200 to 500 objects. Upon arrival, the trays of objects are removed from their specially designed transport boxes, and any specifics about the group are discussed with the curator or museum technician. This might include if any of the objects are particularly fragile or one of a kind and require special care. For instance, we had a VIP object that was a howitzer canister um, that had about 200 grape shot balls. Um, so that was particularly fragile and we wanted to make sure everything uh, stayed together. Next comes the inventory. For every object that comes in, I have to create an examination and treatment report. I have to take the object out of the box, record the number that's assigned to it by DeSoto, and make a quick sketch of it to help distinguish it from its fellow objects. Each object must stay with its corresponding number. It may not sound too difficult, but imagine a box of 118 nearly identical yeast cans, and you get the idea. So I have to make a little sketch with holes so I know which hole goes with which can so I can identify it in the event that it gets mixed up. So these sheets that I create um, stay with the objects, and on them I record the treatments that are done, and how much time it took to complete each treatment. I also note any observations that might be important, such as the presence of original paint or paper labels, such as on this lemonade can. And when I come across anything like that that is out of the ordinary, I discuss treatment op options with Deborah Long, our objects conservator. And while the objects are not being treated, they remain in the trays that they arrived in, um, so as to keep everything in order and everything safe. The next step is to view the object under ultraviolet light. Most previous coatings will fluoresce under UV, as will previous repairs. The color which the coating fluoresces can help determine what type of coating was applied and therefore the best way to remove it. After examining the object under UV, it is time to remove the old coating. And based on the work done from the pilot project, excuse me, we know that most of the lacquers are soluble in acetone and ethanol. But occasionally we come across a coating that does not look quite like the others, like that fixative that I talked about before that's particularly stubborn. Um, it looks different than this. It's really cloudy and you can usually see all of the brush, brush strokes um, on there. So if we come across something that doesn't look like the rest, um, we might need to use a different solvent and a solvent test is performed. A cotton swab is dipped into a solvent and lightly rubbed over a small area of the surface. If the coating is soluble in that solvent, it will easily come up and reveal a small circle of bare metal like you can see for each of the solvents tested there. Once the appropriate solvent is determined, this object is placed in a solvent bath for about 15 to 30 minutes. For some objects, such as hand tools with wooden handles, the coating is removed by hand using cotton swabs and cotton pads. 
And the photo on the right there um, shows the lamp frames I talked about that had the black lacquer um, that was able to come off um, and we were able to just coat them with a clear coating so they look more like they did when they were originally made. Um, after the solvent tank, the object is allowed to dry and corrosion products need to be removed. Sometimes this can be done as easily with a brush or under magnification with a scalpel and bamboo skewer. But most often the object is taken to the air abrasion machine. This machine uses 50 micron glass beads, air driven at around 30 pounds per square inch to remove corrosion products such as rust. The air abrasive chamber itself is slightly bigger than a bread box, as you can see here. And it shoots out tiny glass beads through a wand about the size of a ballpoint pen. So the wand is smaller than this. Um, and to give you an idea of how small 50 microns is, um, each bead is about half the diameter of a human hair. So it's very fine powder. Uh, for larger objects, we use this machine on the right. This machine uses soft abrasive materials such as crust, crushed walnut shells or ground corn cobs as the abrasive material. But works much the same as the smaller machine, just on a larger scale. Uh, we would also use this machine too for softer metals like copper alloy, as the glass beads are too hard for the metal and will damage the surface. The softer abrasives are about as hard as your fingernail and can knock off the corrosion products without marring the surface. After the corrosion is removed and the object, the object is placed in a clean solvent tank to chemically dry and degrease. This ensures that the proper that the coating will stick properly. Once dry, it is time to recoat it. The lacquer coating is made of cellulose nitrate, which is mixed with a thinner. This lacquer is the same that was used before. Even though we know it has a limited lifespan, it has been, it has been extensively studied and been proven to be stable over a comparatively long life. It minimizes the environmental impact on the ob object. Um, we could use an acrylic, um, but acrylics, while they last longer, um, aren't as impervious to the elements as the cellulose nitrate would be. Each object receives two coats of lacquer, which is applied by dipping, brushing, or spraying. The lacquer is dry to the touch in as little as 10 minutes, but takes several days for all of the solvents to evaporate. The object is then placed in a plastic bag along with its DeSoto number and put back in the box that it came in. During the treatment procedure described, there might be other treatments required. Often with food cans, residues of the original foodstuffs remain in the cans and need to be removed with a bamboo skewer or scalpel. I spent many hours removing coffee from 150-year-old coffee cans, and it was pretty hard and full of a lot of sand, so I don't think it would have been very good to drink. Um, I've also had some lard tins that still had 150-year-old lard in the crevices that I had to scrape out. Um, but when this is done, the, any residues or remaining food um, is placed in a plastic bag and labeled with the DeSoto number so that it can stay with the can that it came in. Though we don't attempt to reconstruct any of the artifacts, sometimes fragments come loose in transit or during treatment, and where possible, we can reattach these fragments or in reinforced areas, weak areas, with reme, which is a spun polyester fabric, and we adhere it with lacquer, much like a Band-Aid or a patch. And this, these are shovels from the Bertrand, and these, there was about five of them in this group, and they were not originally treated in the 70s, so that's why it looks particularly rusty. The other ones don't look as bad. Um, but they had some fragments that came off, and in the picture on the right, you can kind of see a pale patch um, in the lost area, and that's the reme that was placed over. So with objects that, uh, another treatment that we do is some objects might have multiple parts that come in contact with each other or moving parts, um, and on these we apply a coating of microcrystalline paste wax over the dried lacquer, this is then buffed, smooth, and it prevents the parts from sticking together as the lacquer continues to release solvents. So once the entire group of objects is completed, the objects and treatment reports are returned to DeSoto. The objects are renumbered and after treatment photos are taken by staff at the refuge. The metals projects, metal project's goal is to conserve 10,000 objects, which is a lot, but is only a small percentage of the metals in the collection. We are now in the second year of phase four and DeSoto continues to do fundraising for the care of the collection. And DeSoto faces the same problems that many museums face, juggling access and conservation, and finding the time, money, and staff to successfully care for the collection. <coughs> and then once this 
project is complete, you know, what will happen to the other, will we move on to the other uh, parts of the collection. But some of the lessons learned from the Bertrand are that this is a really great, unique collection. But a collection such as this needs to be cared for. If another such project were to be undertaken, it is important that the resources be secured for the care of the collection in perpetuity. No one at the time knew how much work and resources would be involved in the maintenance of the Bertrand collection. But it's also important for future undertakings of this kind that conservators be involved as early as possible. The remarkable state of the collection today is a real testament to the work of the conservators and staff all those years ago, as well as, to, as well as to the continuous commitment of the current staff to proper preventive care. The artifacts from the Bertrand are a truly unique and valuable collection of Civil War era material culture. It gives a window into the lives of people living in the mining towns of Montana. The Bertrand collection is an invaluable resource for those interested in researching the 19th century. While Corbino and Purcell did not find the fortune they were seeking, a treasure of a different sort was certainly uncovered. The end. If you have any questions, I will try and answer them to the best of my ability. When you're preserving metal objects, do you ever um, simply preserve objects as they come out without attempting to remove any of the corrosion for reference value or anything like that? Or, or do you always try to remove you know, well, the objects? In this case, because there were so many objects of the same kind, like the shovels, there were some that were left untreated to use as a study reference. And um, when those shovels came to us, they, some of them had paint, original a paint or coating that was on there. And we had to discuss with um, Dean, the curator, of whether or not he wanted us to remove them, because if we treated them, that paint would be gone. Um, and so they were able to find some other shovels that they knew that they could keep as reference that still had that coating, and so that we could retreat treat the ones that we had, and those can still be compared to the ones that were treated originally, so, yeah. But that doesn't happen often if you have a very limited number of things, but when the scale, 680,000 objects, they have some room. So anything else? Yes, sir? Or? Has there been a value established for the items brought up from the Japan? I have no idea. Dean, do you know? It'd be hard to know. I mean, the bottles alone are Priceless. I mean, collectors would give any amount of money for a lot of those. So I would, I wouldn't even have a guess. Yeah, and as conservators, we're not um, allowed to kind of establish value because we treat everything as if it's priceless. So. Yeah. With the time and expense involved, you know, when you have such a large collection, and say I'm just throwing out a number, you have three thousand cans of. Mm -hmm. Why go to the time and expense? Because I saw some, the shape of mm -hmm. some of those. Or, the, or you have some beautiful shovels that are intact. Right. Why go to the expense of trying to fix one that's just totally shattered? You know, why right. don't you just um, you know, put your concentration on the ones that are in pretty good shape? Right. That's a very good question. Um, she asked, you know, why would we kind of bother treating some of these cans that are in such good shape? Well, part of the um, importance of this collection is the collection as a whole. It represents all of these items that were being shipped to these mining towns, and it's basically like a general store. And so it gives a really good snapshot of what, you know, a ship would be carrying. And so that collection as a whole is really important, and so we want to protect them um, as best we can. But it's not necessarily important to make them look like new, and what we do, because we have things that are just in fragments, but we keep the fragments because those are important. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, these are all um, non-living artifacts that came from there, but would the Bertrand have carried living things that were probably salvaged in the first days when, uh, like, say, livestock or seeds or, or, or mm -hmm. pioneers and things like that? Um, he asked if there were any living um, objects on the Bertrand when it was originally excavated. Um, Dean might be able to answer this, but I would assume that they were, they were removed at the time as it was um, sinking um, because all the people were able to get off and they just sat there and waited till the next boat came along and hopped on, so I'm sure if there were any. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any livestock on mm -hmm. board. Um, we do have a lot of animal bones in the collection, but that's mostly from butchered meat that was probably salted and, and being brought up mm -hmm. the river. And as far as seeds go, I don't... Recall seeing any seeds, but there are a wide variety of nuts. Mm. 
you know, from pecans to almonds to the regular uh, Google Pea type peanuts. Um, and we're just assuming that those are just food items. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, it, it is amazing that some of the butter and, and like you mentioned, the lard and yeah. honey, bottles of honey that look just as good now as, as they were 150 years ago, maple syrup and some of these other items that survived all those years, you know, yeah. 30 feet underground. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, the container, the mercury was there, mm -hmm. the type of mercury, um, was that discharged or lost in the mud? Well, they got most of the carboys and mercury off at the time that it was. It's a, how would you describe a carboy? It's basically a big metal bottle yeah. made out of lead. Uh, it looks like an air tank that scuba divers put on the back. And uh, there were only nine of those recovered from the Bertrand. And Originally, it was like 100 that were on board, so they got 90 of them. Very heavy. So obviously, they wouldn't have floated down river or anything like that. And so we're just assuming that Salvers got those other 91. Yeah. And then the contents of those nine that were found were sold by the two uh, men who found right. the, uh, the items because that was a part of the contract that the uh, government had made up with them. Any mercury, uh, whiskey, or gold that they found, they, they could redeem to recoup their losses you know, for the money that they spent in finding. But was it silver, red, mercury, what kind of... Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I don't know. I have never seen anything that actually specifically said that, so I don't know. But it was used in the processing of the silver and gold ores. Um, I don't know. It would be interesting to get a sample and find out. That's yeah. Find out. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir? Were any whiskey barrels uh, recovered in that? Um, they didn't say any whiskey barrels, but um, in the report it says there were like 50 bottles. Oh, bottles. Yeah, and I think if they had written the contract differently and just said alcohol, they would have gotten much more because all of the medicinal bitters were highly alcoholic, and but they didn't. <laughs> and was so, this the maiden voyage of this? Um, not the maiden voyage because it had worked on other rivers, the Ohio River before. But I think this was might have been its first voyage on the Missouri, and April Fool's Day it sank. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. I think stopped using the lead line food containers by that time. I'm. I believe so. I, I, we don't think we've come across any lead. It's mostly uh, tinned sheet iron, so it's iron that has tin on it, but I don't know if there's... Some of them have lead soldering mm -hmm. on them. Right. The liners are no longer lead. Yeah, and so I think some of the jars have lead um, Seal. seals on top. Yes, ma'am? Since the Missouri River always had shifting sandbars, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that other uh, the coral mm -hmm. that also sunk at the same week. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other uh, boats that are going to be um, searching for at this time? I'm sure there are. Um, I don't know enough about it, but there were, like I said, there's an entire encyclopedia of Civil War shipwrecks, and the Missouri was particularly well known for losing ships. Um, and I'm sure there are people out there that are like Sam and uh, Jesse who are think there's a treasure ship out there and they want to find it. It's just, can you find somebody that's willing to take care of it? That's a big thing as well. So, yes, sir? Were there any particularly dramatic revelations uh, concerning the culture of the high plains or anything like that that you were able to discern from these artifacts? Or um, just the general knowledge? I don't know. I know that, like, the, one of the big surprises was the leather, the rubber slickers. I think that's pretty, I, mean, I don't know how startling it is. I'm not an expert in 19th century uh, material culture, but that's a, and some of them are in really, really great shape to this day, and some of them have completely deteriorated and are like uh, potato chips. And so they're wondering if there's different processes involved um, in treating them or when they were originally uh, manufactured. So there's some interesting things in there, but I don't know if there's anything. I don't know, Dean. It's, it, to me, it's amazing. It's almost like walking into a hardware store today. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology, you know, has not changed a great deal. So, you know, a shovel that you would get off the bird hands would not be noticeably different than the one you'd get from Ace Hardware. Right. And, and then the company that made those shovels is still in business <laughs> in Philadelphia. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you walk in there and you go to sort of see that, well, maybe they do things a little bit differently, but they're still satisfying the same basic right. needs that everyone has. I think some of the food combinations, there were some cans that supposedly had oysters and peaches. And peaches, yeah. And that is 
shockingly <laughs> bad to me. <laughs> uh, also, just things like instant lemonade. Like, I just wouldn't have thought of that, but there I'm treating a considerable number of instant lemonade cans at the um, moment. And they still, a lot of them still have their paper labels and even has directions on how to make it. So that's been really interesting mm -hmm. to see. Going to, was, it, was it going to a particular landing place or would it just service camps up and down? Or um, it was headed for, uh, I think, Fort Benton was one of the stops um, in Montana. And so it was just going to go to all these little... Um, that, would that supply like a general store there or something? I, I believe so. It would be shipped in out to the mining camp. Yeah. yeah sold there. Okay. Yes, ma'am? The conservatory, um, is, are they going to be working on anything else besides a um, steamboat? Or? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, I was just hired. That's my job is to work on uh, the Bertrand objects. But we have things from um, local universities, private individuals bring things in. Um, so we're always working on sometimes multiple projects at once. But I was just, that's my job is to work on Bertrand things with the help of Deb, our head objects conservator. <laughs> I'm not left to my own devices. Yes, sir? Let's assume I have an old painting and I don't know <coughs> who painted it or how old it is. Mm -hmm. Can that be brought in and mm -hmm. taken care of? Yep, they yeah. can't give you any kind of evaluation of it, um, right. but they can uh, likely tell you how old it is. And um, just with Kenneth's knowledge of paintings, he might be able to say who did it or not. Um, and we've actually had a painting that came in that the owner thought it was by a particular artist, but looking at the signature, um, we actually Googled the name and found out that it was somebody else, and so, And then yeah. you charge an hour or eight or a set mm -hmm. fee for it? Yeah, there are charges for um, just the examination mm -hmm. and uh, the proposal and then treat, uh, charge for treatment. But they, uh, when they write a proposal, they'll give you an estimate of how much it will cost, and you know, then you can prove that. Sir? The two people who found this, did they have any archaeological background or training? I don't know. I, think, I don't think so. I think they're pilots and just okay. thought, let's go they for it. Research this historical yeah, they looked at maps and accounts and how the river had changed. And yeah, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> yes, ma'am? I remember I was in junior high and my parents took me up there when the ship was lying in uh -huh. mud before they let it fill in with water. Right. And at that time, it was all for money. It was all, they thought they were really going to get, yeah. um, you know, gold mine there. Yeah. Not so much. I think they, I read somewhere that they pretty much broke even with their costs to dig it up. Is that it? Well, thank you very much for having me today.